This is the seventh reading of Wonder, and this uh, next chapter is called Jack Will. I hung out with Jack in homeroom. English, history, computers, music, and science, which were all the classes that we had together. The teachers assigned seats in every class, and I ended up sitting next to Jack in every single one of those classes, and I, um, so I figured either the teachers were told to put me with Jack together, or that was a totally incredible coincidence. I think the teachers might have been told to put us together. I walked to class with Jack too. I know he noticed kids staring at me, but he pretended not to notice. One time though, when we were on our way to history, this huge eighth grader who was zooming down the stairs two steps at a time accidentally bumped into us at the bottom of the stairs and knocked me down. As the guy helped me to stand up, he got to look at my face and without even meaning to, he went, whoa. And then he patted me on the shoulder like he was dusting me off and took off after his friends. For some reason, me and Jack started to crack up. That guy made the funniest face, said Jack, as we sat down at his, our desks. I know, right? He was like, whoa. I swear I think he wet his pants. We were laughing so hard that the teacher, Mr. Roche, had to ask us to settle down. Later, after we finished reading about how ancient Sumerians built sundials, Jack whispered, do you ever want to beat those kids up? I shrugged. I guess I don't know. I want to. I think you should get a secret squirt gun or something and attach it to your eyes somehow. And every time someone stares at you, you would squirt them in the face. With some green slime or something? I answered, no, no, with slug juice mixed with dog pee. Yeah, I said, completely agreeing. Guys, said Mr. Roche across the room, people are still reading. We nodded and looked down at our books. Then Jack whispered, are you going to, are you going to look this way, August? I mean, can't you get plastic surgery or something? Aren't you always going to look this way? I smiled and I pointed to my face. Hello, this is after plastic surgery. Dude, you should sue your doctor, he answered between giggles. This time, the two of us were laughing so much we couldn't stop, even after Miss Roach came over and made us both switch chairs with the kids next to us. So we're actually learning that Jack Wills is happy to ask Augie questions and Augie is quite happy to answer those questions. Mr. Brown's October precept. Interesting, I found what looks a bit like precepts in a magazine, look. These are bookmarks, giant bookmarks, so they fit inside the magazine, and they've got different quotes on them. Can you see the quotes at the top? They're kind of precepts, and then on the back, you can fill in whatever they've challenged. So in this case, this one is a Christmas one, and it says, at Christmas, all roads lead to home, and then it's eight favorite Christmas songs. This one says, be a rainbow in someone else's cloud. So if someone's feeling sad, cheer them up. And it says, eight ways to add color to my day, but it could be eight ways to add color to someone else's day. Here's another one. This one. Once a year, go somewhere you've never been before. And then on the back, you make a list of eight destinations you'd love to visit. That's quite nice, isn't it? There's loads of these in all the mag these particular magazines that I'm reading at the moment. Your deeds are your monuments. The things you do are the things that are going to be left behind after you die, like the memories or what you've changed in the world, the impact you've had in the world. Mr. Brown's precept for October was, your deeds are your monuments. He told us that this was written on the tombstone of some Egyptian guys that died thousands of years ago. Since we were just about to start studying ancient Egypt and history, Mr. Brown thought it was a good choice for a precept. Our homework assignment was to write a paragraph about what we thought the precept meant or how we felt about it. This is what I wrote. This precept means that we should be remembered for the things we do. The things we do are more important things of all. They are more important than what we say and what we look like. 
The things we do outlast our mortality, like outlast us when we die. The things we do are like monuments that people build to honour their heroes after they've died. They're like the pyramids that the Egyptians built to honour the pharaohs. Only instead of being made out of stone, they're made out of the memories people have of you. So you don't actually have a monument, you just have these memories. That's why your deeds are like your monuments, built with memories instead of stone. What do you think about that quote? Your deeds are your monuments. Would you like to turn and talk about it? My birthday's October 10th. I like my birthday, 10-10. I wonder if we should try and remember that and we could have a little birthday party for Augie. My birthday is October 10th. I like my birthday, 10-10. It would have been great if I'd born had been exact, at exactly 10 past 10 in the morning or at night, but I wasn't. I was born just after midnight, midnight, but I still think my birthday's cool. I usually have a little party at home, but this year, Mum asked if I could, I asked Mum if I could have a big bowling party. Mum was surprised, but really happy. She asked me who I wanted to ask for my class, and I said everyone in my homeroom in summer. That's a lot of kids, Augie. Well, I have to invite everyone, I said, because I don't want people's feelings to get hurt if they find out that other people invi are invited and they aren't, okay? Okay. Well, you even want to invite that what's-a-deal kid? Yeah, you can invite Julian, I answered. Jeez, Mum. You should forget about that already. I know, you're right. A couple of weeks later, I asked mum who was coming to my party and she said, Jack, Will, Summer, Reed, both Maxes and a couple of other kids who were going to try to be there. Like who? Well, Charlotte's mum said that Charlotte has a dance recital earlier in the day, but she'll try and get to your party if time allowed. And Tristan's mum might said he might come, but after his soccer game. So that's it, like five people? It's more than five people, Augie. I think a lot of people just have plans already. Mum answered. We were in the kitchen and she was cutting one of the apples we'd gotten in the farmer's market into teensy-weensy bits so I could eat it properly. Remember, he has a jaw issue. What, what kind of plans? I don't know, Augie, but we did send out the Evites quite late. Like, what did they tell you, though? What reasons did they give? Oh, Augie's now feeling panicky. People going to your birthday party definitely is a sure sign. You make up stories in your head, don't you? Oh, why are they not coming? Don't they like me? So it is a good idea if you can't go to a party that you give a really clear reason why. And make sure it's honest. Everyone gave different reasons, Augie. She sounded a bit impatient. Really, sweetie? It shouldn't matter what their reasons are. People had plans, that's all. What did Julian give us his reason, I asked. Do you know, his mum was the only person who didn't reply at all. I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. When you say an apple doesn't fall far from, from the tree, it means you're very similar to your parents or your brother or sister. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. But hang on, this is super important later in the story. Julian's mum and dad did not reply. So just remember that, okay? Keep that in your head. I laughed because I thought she was making a joke, but then I realised she wasn't. What does that mean? I asked. Never mind, go wash your hands so you can eat. My bath birthday party turned out to be much smaller than I thought it would be, but it was still great. Jack, Summer, Reed, Tristan, both Maxes came from school and Christopher came, all the way from Bridgeport with his parents. And Uncle Ben came, and Aunt Kate and Uncle Poe drove down from Boston, though Tata and Papa were in Florida for the winter. It was fun because all the grown-ups ended up bowling in the lane next to ours, so it really felt like there was lots of people there to celebrate my birthday. Remember, he's not been at school before, so he's probably not experienced birthday parties. At lunch the next day, Summer asked me what I was going to be for Halloween. 
Of course I've been thinking about it since last Halloween, so I knew, right? Boba Fett. You know you can wear a costume to school for Halloween, right? No way, really? So long as it's politically correct. What? No guns and stuff? Yeah, exactly. What about blasters? No, I think a blaster's like a gun, Augie. Oh, man, Boba Fett has a blaster. At least we don't have to come like a character in a book anymore. In the lower school, that's what you had to do. Last year, I was the Wicked Witch of the West from The Wizard of Oz. But that's a movie, not a book. Hello, it was a book first, said Summer. One of my favourite books in the world, actually. My dad used to read it to me every night in the first grade. When Summer talks, especially when she's excited about something, her eyes squint like she's looking right into the sun. I hardly ever see Summer during the day, since the only class we have together is English. But ever since that first lunch, we've sat on the summer table together every day, just the two of us. So what are you going to be? I asked her. I don't know yet. I know what I'd really want to go as, but I think it might be too dorky. You know, Savannah's group isn't even wearing costumes this year. I think maybe we're too old for Halloween. What? That's just dumb. Oh, no, that's right. I know. I thought you didn't care about what those girls think. She shrugged and took a long drink of, mi drink of milk. So, what dorky thing do you want to dress up as? I asked her, smiling. Promise not to laugh. She raised her eyebrows and her shoulders embarrassed, and she said, a unicorn. I smiled and looked down at my sandwich. Hey, you promised not to laugh. Okay, okay, but you're right. It is quite dorky for our age. I know, but I've had it all planned out and I made a head out of paper mache. I'd make a head out of paper mache and paint the horn gold and make the main gold too. It would be so awesome. Okay, then you should do it. Who cares what other people think, right? Maybe what I'll do is just wear it for the Halloween parade, she said, snapping her fingers. And I'll be like a goth girl for school. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Sounds like a plan. Thanks, Augie. You know, that's what I like best of you. I feel like I can tell you anything. Yeah, I answered, nodding. I gave her a thumbs up. Cool beans. <laughs> school pictures. Ah, think about it. You have to get your photo taken, remember? Okay, turn and talk about what you think is going to happen in this chapter. School pictures. It's a short chapter. I don't think anyone would be shocked to learn I don't want to have my tick picture taken on October the 22nd. No way, no thank you. I stopped letting anyone take pictures of me a while ago. I guess you could call it a phobia. Not actually, it's not a phobia, it's an aversion, which is a word I just learned in Mr. Brown's class. I have an aversion to having my picture taken. There, I used it in a sentence. I thought mum would try and get me to drop my aversion to having my picture taken for school, but she didn't. Unfortunately, while I managed to avoid having the portrait taken, I couldn't get out of being in the class one. Ugh, the photographer looked like he'd just sucked on a lemon when he saw me. I'm sure he thought I ruined the picture. I was one of the ones in the front sitting down. I didn't smile. Not that anyone could tell if I had. Cheese touch. Oh dear. Oh dear. This is upsetting for anyone. I noticed not long ago that even though people were getting used to me, no one actually touched me. I didn't realise this at first because it's not like other kids go around touching each other at much in the middle school anyway. But last Thursday in dance class, which is like my least favourite class, Mrs. Atanabi, the teacher, tried to make Shimina Chin be my dance partner. Now, I've never actually seen anyone have a panic attack before, but I heard about it, and I'm pretty sure Shimina had a panic attack at that second. She got really nervous, and she turned pale, 
and literally broke into a sweat within a minute. And then she came up with some lame excuse about really having to go to the bathroom. Anyway, Miss Atanabe let her off the hook because she ended up not making anyone dance together. Then yesterday, in my science elective, we were doing this cool mystery powder investigation where we had to classify a substance as an acid or a base. Everyone had to heat their mystery powders on a heating pallet and make observations. So they were all huddled around the powders with our notebooks. Now, there were eight kids in the elective and seven of them were squished together on one side of the plate, while one of them, me, had loads of room on the other side. So of course I noticed this, but I was hoping Miss Rubin wouldn't notice because she didn't. I didn't want her to say anything but of course she did notice this. And of course she did say something. Guys, there's plenty of room around this side. Tristan, Nino, you go over this side. So Tristan and Nino scooted over to my side. Tristan and Nino have always been okay, nice to me. I want to go on record as saying, not super nice. Like they don't go out of their way to hang out with me, but okay, nice. Like they say hello to me. Or talk to me like normal. They didn't even make a face when Miss Rubin told them to come around this side. Which a lot of kids would do when they think I'm not looking. Anyway, everything was going fine, fine until Tristan's mystery powder started melting. He moved his foil off the plate just as my powder began to melt too. Which is why I went to move mine off the plate. And then my hand accidentally bumped his hand for a fraction of a second. Tristan jerked his hand away so fast he dropped his foil on the floor while also knocking everyone else's foil off the heating plate. Tristan! yelled Mrs. Rubin. But Tristan didn't even care about the spilled powder on the floor or even that he'd ruined the experiment. What he was most concerned about was getting to the lab sink as quickly as possible to wash his hands. That's when I knew for sure that there was this thing about touching me at Beecher Prep. I think it's like the cheese touch in the diary of a wimpy kid. The kids in the story were afraid they'd catch the cooties if they touched the old mouldy cheese on the basketball court. At Beecher Prep, I'm the old mouldy cheese.